schönen guten Abend. Schön, dass ihr noch so alle da seid mit diesem Fokus noch zum Schluss. Ist das die letzte Runde oder kommt danach noch eine? Vorletzte. Vorletzte. Ich bin nicht das Letzte. Ihr armen Schweine müsst nach mir, nach mir noch eine Sessionrunde durch. Egal wie. Äh, ich firmiere unter dem Namen Alinbunetz. Das lässt sich leicht merken. Das steht nämlich für alles in Butter. Ähm, Thema heute, Requirements Engineering. Wer hat von Requirements Engineering dann schon mal was gehört? Ist so das typische Bild. Wer von euch ist mit Projektmanagement, Product Owning, wie auch immer, beschäftigt von euch? Deutlich mehr, genau. Ähm, Requirements Engineering kennt man eigentlich in Großunternehmen durchaus, vor allen Dingen, wenn es um Wasserfallprojekte geht, also so Old Style, gar nicht agil, sondern Old Style. Da geht es nämlich wirklich darum, das sorgfältig zu machen, das strukturiert zu machen, nicht nur so aus dem Bauchgefühl. Wir haben hier in Deutschland ein richtiges Problem, dass äh, man irgendwo als Ingenieur, als Programmierer, als wie auch immer meistens unterwegs ist, äh, sich hervortut, gut wird. Englisch. Englisch. Okay, uh, we have that problem that uh, in uh, today's um, organizations, you're getting good in what you're doing as an engineer, developer, what else? And they say, okay, let's elevate your career. You are now a product owner or a project manager or a team leader. And suddenly, you, what, what you have to do, um, that focus changes away from developing, which you are extremely good at towards what is called requirements engineering, product management, project management, product owning, which you have never learned. And uh, where you use gut feeling to come up with, yeah, maybe we do it in that and that and that way and it will turn out fine. Most of the times, if you're good, most if you have a good gut feeling, most of the times it'll turn out fine, just fine. But often enough uh, you encounter problems like um, yes, you're dealing with the client, you ask the client, hey, come on client, what do you want? Which requirements have to be fulfilled for your project, uh, project to succeed? The client says, yeah. Functionality A, B, C, and D, please. And you deliver A, B, C, and D. And the client asks, ah, what about E? Do you say? Fuck E, you never told us about E. And he says, yeah, come on, that's so obvious. Of course, we can't live without E. And that's a problem, It's especially if you're not in, in the agile world, especially if you're still left in, in the waterfall world. Um, it's even a problem if that doesn't happen right at the end, then it's a massive problem, then it's a catastrophe. But when it's happening right in the middle, that can um, often happen because uh, the, the surroundings, the conditions of the project changes, the world is changing very, very fast on a rapid pace, and thus maybe uh, the client says at the beginning A, B, C, and D, and in the middle of the project he says we don't need C anymore, but we need Z. So every change in the plan of the project is something which interrupts everything, which delays um, the, the, the deadlines, which lets the budget of the project explode. So waterfall is not very good as a project management in dealing with these kinds of interruptions. Yeah. So it's especially important to not only use gut feeling here, but to, to do it a little bit more scientific and if you're in Agile and you think, oh, no problem in Agile, because in Agile, changes within the project is just integral part of Agile project management, so no problem. You're 
quite right, but still, it's good to have something more scientific there as just your gut feeling. What I will tell you in this pretty short session is just, yeah, let's say a little insight in the whole requirements engineering thing. I, I will demonstrate you two um, very helpful tools which hopefully will improve your working right starting on Monday with your clients in your projects. But still, it's just that much of the whole universe. If you think that's worth it to dig into more, you're on the right track. So, let's see. For example, uh, you have to know that there are different kinds of requirements. You can categorize uh, requirements, and if you do, you can find out about the hidden requirements as well. And to show you this, I have a graph for you. This graph is called the Kano model, um, named after a Japanese a uh, guy who is into requirements engineering, uh, Mr. Kano, and he did the following. Within this graph, on this axis, you have the customer satisfaction. Neutral very bad mood, very happy customer. On this axis, you have the degree on how functionality is delivered. That might be on how many functionality is done or on which degrees are all functionalities delivered. So maybe you're dealing with search, on-site search, and you have to deal with news, and you deal with both of them in parallel, and you do the very important things first, like for the on-site search, you do full-text search, but you might deliver like a faceted search later. So with the degree of fulfillment, you go along this axis. That doesn't mean, okay, here you have search and here you have news. That could be here you have standard search and news and here you have uh, full-fledged news and a faceted search. Okay. So from zero to everything. Now there are three archetypes of requirements. The first archetype we know of is the standard requirements. These requirements are just easy because these requirements you can find out by just asking your client, what do you want? And he tells you A, B, C, and D. Now, if you do not fulfill these requirements at all, what about the customer satisfaction? Zero? No. Yeah. Down here. If you have fulfilled all of these, where's the customer satisfaction? Up, down, up, 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 up. Yeah. Actually, research shows it's pretty much kind of straightforward thing. Which is cool, because if it's only standard requirements, <laughs> you only have to deliver half of them, and you're in the OK zone. Above this line is where the customer will uh, give you the paycheck. Below this line, the customer will go to court. But that's not all. 
There are also these kinds of requirements which the customer says, yeah, uh, come on, that's obvious. I don't have to tell you. How do you think can one figure out these requirements? Because let's face it, these are the most pressing requirements. These are really the things where, where, where yeah, most critical ones. If you don't deliver them, it's a problem. How to find out these? These requirements, if you ask your customer, come on, is that all? Is that it? Or are there any more requirements? The customer will say at the beginning of the project or before, uh, yeah, that's all. How do you find out the others? Just a hint. The customer says, I didn't mention them because they are obvious. And these you find out just by having a look at the previous version of your project or product or what else. I always like to take the example of a smartphone. Uh, think of your customer being Apple. And uh, the project is to come up with the concept for the new iPhone. You ask Apple, OK, the new iPhone. Let's talk functionalities. Tell me, what do you want? And Apple will tell, blah, 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 blah. Will they tell you the functionality that you should be able to place a call, a phone call with the iPhone? Will they mention this? Usually not. But if you have a look at the previous version of the iPhone, you'll find this functionality. If you do a website relaunch, have a look at the old website and find out what is possible by now, by today. And count on it. These are the functionalities where the customer says this is obvious. Some of these functionalities might be um, obsolete, so it's good to, to collect them and to think about do we need it anymore or don't we need it anymore? But this is hard work. Actually, this um, kind of requirements engineering is called archaeological requirements engineering because you have to dig. Usually, you do not have a good documentation where all these things are documented. OK, just imagine a smartphone you can't place a call with. Where is customer satisfaction? Here? A smartphone you can't place phone calls with. Oh my god. Now, uh, you can place phone calls. Where is the customer satisfaction? In Franconia, they say this post. Or in Bavaria. That's just good enough. These requirements are called base requirements. These are the most important requirements. This is your first duty. You need to fulfill the base requirements. And you, may, you, you better be sure to have them like near to 100% fulfilled. Because with the base requirements, there is no such, yeah, let's do the most of them and the customer will be happy. No, you better look out and find out about all of them. Actually, if you have pretty much all base requirements and you ha have half of the standard requirements, then you're fine. This is a secret, so actually, if you're doing a good prioritization, if you do first the base requirements, then the most pressing and most urgent part of the standard requirements, you're fine. And that's usually about 60-65% of what the customer uh, would expect from you. There's a third category, a third archetype of requirements. 
And these are the requirements the customer doesn't know at the beginning. And these are the requirements where you come into place as, as experts and you tell the customer, hey, customer, look here and here and here. We could do this and this and this and you ca can get extra value on that. That's a little bit like also innovation, new stuff, hot stuff. If we don't deliver these hot, new, innovative features, where is the customer satisfaction? Zero. Zero, exact. Now, if you deliver them, so this is the first important thing. These, this, this Kano model should be absolutely essential knowledge to all kinds of product people because it helps you tremendously to figure out and prioritize what to do first. Questions? The second thing is very important second thing I want to introduce to you because uh, where do you get the requirements from? Where is my source of requirements? Pardon? Yeah, actually uh, uh, what requirements engineering says or how they describe it, the stakeholders. And the stakeholders is just more than the guy or girl from the customer who is your contact at your customers. Stakeholder is much more. Stakeholder are the people who are using the product or project when it's finished and done, like the website visitors. These are the sponsors. Sponsors are the guys who pay uh, the check give you the check, you give you the money. But you do not only have like human uh, uh, stakeholders, but you have also non-human stakeholders like um, DSGVO, what is it in English? Uh, 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 GDBR. So legal stuff can also consider to be in uh, that uh, yeah, concept of stakeholders. So they are human and non-human stakeholders. But let's talk about human stakeholders. Usually we have only one contact person. And the bigger the customer company gets, the more problem come around when you only have one contact person. Because usually it's not a full authorized person who is in the position of deciding where to go, what to do, where to put the logo, which color to put with the logo, if it has a shadow or non-shadow or whatever. Um, but these people like to pretend, yeah, you know, I'm your contact partner, ask me everything, I will deliver you the answers. So first of all, you need to understand that it's never good to have just one contact partner to talk about the uh, requirements with. Best is to have more stakeholders, to not forget stakeholders. On the other side, so it's, it's good to have at, uh, as much stakeholders as possible. On the other side, um, you have to have a balance between having too many stakeholders and thus needing too much time for requirements engineering to ask them all to do interviews, to do stuff, whatever, and to have not enough stakeholders to not cover all requirements which there are. So it's also good to divide stakeholders in categories. And please, 
you're better off to not tell your stakeholders how you categorize them. <laughs> so on this axis, is the interest in the project or product. Zero interest. Yeah, just do the website and don't bother me. High interest. I want to decide about everything which is going on with this website. And the influence, the power, the decision power. I'm not authorized to decide anything about this project. I have full influence. This influence might be like uh, I have full power and influence because I'm the one paying the whole thing. Or this might be influence because uh, it's a group of people who have a perfect high influence. If they are not happy, uh, the sponsor is not happy and won't pay you. So. Could be both. Now we can have four quadrants and depending on where the stakeholders are, you can decide on how to handle best these kinds of stakeholders. Low interest, low influence. Yeah. Just observe. Just have an eye on them, but don't bother them about them too much. It's just wasted time and you do not have the money to deal with them. Low influence, but high interests. You better be transparent. You better inform them. Actually, this is the kind of group where this is the kind of source of shitstorms. Actually, these people are perfectly happy when they are informed when the project is transparent because shitstorms shit usually uh, are based on uh, missing trust. Yeah, these guys up there, the hierarchy, they do uh, decisions and they don't know about how to decide and what to decide. Uh, with Mercedes-Benz, the headquarter up there was called Bullshit Castle over a long time period. So, um, and always if you do not inform, if you are not transparent, there will be stories about it. Like from the pub. They will come up with stories, if it's the truth or not, th that's kind of, yeah, maybe you're lucky. If you inform, everything's fine. Maybe if you inform, somebody says, yeah, you missed something and you're in a positive dialogue. If you don't inform, shit storms. High influence, low interest. These are the kind of people who say, just don't bother me, deliver me the baby. I don't want to have any birth pains. I just want to have the baby. Satisfy them. These are two, usually the guys and girls who say, okay, I'm in charge to sign the check, the paycheck. But, but just leave me alone with all the nitty gritty details. I, I don't care about these. And it's good to just to satisfy them. For example, if you have an important meeting with your client um, where you, where you uh, discuss the functionality delivered by now, want to get some feedback and stuff, please have a clear look at your agenda. Make it like the first part of the meeting, your management summary, have a chance, like a little coffee break or something, that these guys 
can step out of the meeting right at that point and are not bothered with all the details which have to be, cast, uh, be discussed afterwards. Make sure that you know which kind of coffee they are drinking. Just satisfy them. Find out what is important for them, really, and satisfy them. and have enough people here in the upper right corner which are highly interested and have a high influence. These are the people you want to cooperate with. These are the people where it's like charm to work with them together. Especially if you go into the agile um, project management direction where you need to have a um, close cooperation with your clients where it is perfect if the clients kind of feels like being part of, of the development team where you after one two or three weeks uh, you can say uh, yeah it feels like we are one unit it's not like client and service provider but we are all working together having one goal and going there and trying to get away all obstacles which are in the way these are the ones you need. If you do not have enough of them, try to recruit them from the other categories. Now, stakeholders may be human or just like legal or documentation, security guidelines, whatever you have where you can pull out, get out some requirements, you have to pay attention. All these you sh better document, document these. Usually you are one product owner or one project manager and stakeholders are your prime source of requirements, your prime source where to address to if you have questions. Think about you getting ill and somebody else have has to jump in into your position and you do not have a documentation who are my stakeholders. This is one of the most critical things, business critical things at all. So better have um, stakeholder directory where you have data on who are my stakeholders or which documents do I have to pay attention with the human stakeholders? How can I contact them? Phone number, email. When can I contact them? When are they present? Like uh, during uh, the project uh, development, uh, maybe the one or the other is on holidays. Have these information at hand here and you can do your planning lots easier when to do which meetings with which clients. Also document who is responsible for which part of the website, for example, or which part of functionality. Who is the marketing guy? Who is the legal guy? And this is the tricky part. You should better document in which kind of stakeholder group they are. In a way, when they do see the stakeholder uh, documentation, that they do not figure out, oh, I'm low influence and low interest. Uh, that is not important because they have usually so low interest that's just uh, they don't care that they are in that group. Um, anyway, this is the tricky part that you kind of have um, a, a secret language where you can uh, see with your colleagues, ah, this is an important stakeholder or this is an important but non-interested stakeholder I need to satisfy. 
These are just two tools, the Kano model, the categorization of stakeholders. There's much more in there, like dealing with clients right at the beginning. If you have a look at these stakeholders, you see that uh, they are not an even group with like shared interests. Usually they want it cheap and fast. They want to have high functionality. And you see it's a clash of interests. You have two possibilities as a product, uh, as product people. The first responsibility or the per first uh, possibility is you say, yeah, we'll deal with it. It will be cheap and fast, the delivery. And you tell the others, yeah, don't, don't care about it. We'll do that. There will be all functionalities. And then you're fucked up. Sorry, my French. But that's the way it is. So for you, it's especially important to get stakeholders, different stakeholders on one table at the beginning and make sure that they understand that they are not on one line, that they don't have a, a common focus on the project. Make sure they are not doing something like projecting this problem on you as a service provider, then you're, as I said, fucked up. So you have to, to uh, also pay attention on these things. So it's good to have like conflict management skills, uh, business moderation skills, to pay attention on these things. Everything here, it's just a, a very quick insight into requirements, uh, helps you tremendously and um, adds on top of your good gut feeling and helps you tremendously even uh, with the agile project management to come up with a lot more of security, see the, um, the danger zones and makes you, uh, enables you to, to uh, go around the danger zones. Be more aware of what is actually happening. There are good books and here comes the marketing. Yeah, of course. I do requirements engineering workshops three days long. Um, but besides that, there are a lot of good books. Um, I only know them from the German language. I'm sorry there. I can recommend you. This website, this is the International Requirements Engineering Board, which is located in Karlsruhe. They have also, of course, everybody has a certification, um, yet they also have some sources, some books they mention for the preparation of the certification. And these books are really good to get an insight and uh, to, to see what is about requirements engineering above these two things which I just demonstrated. Now I only can recommend to get into this. Questions? Cool. Yes? There is always. Give me one example where there is not. New company, new website. Okay, <laughs> got me. <laughs> new company, new website. You have a look around what do the others do in that yeah. regard, yeah? If it's completely new, new niche or something like this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I haven't talked about, we, that is something interesting here. Right, these are, you just ask, mm -hmm. these are dig. How about these? How to get these? I mean, if you have time, if you have done all these, you have managed to get over here. Now you want to make a round up and, and, and uh, 
top, top the whole thing with some of these, of the satisfaction uh, requirements. Uh, how to get these? Kind of invent them. How do you do that? Looking around. Uh, Talking around? Looking around. Ah, looking around. Uh, other, uh, similar companies. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Because everything has been there already. You just have to uh, kind of, of uh, put it together differently and build something new about. Yeah, actually, in this kind of requirements, you go for everything which is creative. Yeah, design thinking, for example. Walt Disney method, if you know that, if you don't know, just Google it. Um, looking around, what have others done? There is a nice video, um, is it in German or in English? I'm not sure, from one kind of science slam. I will uh, do a tweet later on and will link this video. So if you're interested in that, Better follow me on Twitter. I'll do that within the next hour. That's um, a short talk, about 10 minutes, about what is creativity and how can you achieve creativity. A little insight, but also, again, business moderation stuff. How can you bring people together and work creative on problems? on projects. That's what you should also know and uh, be able and capable of delivering business moderation. Thank you very much.